I am Anne Moskoff. I'm an occupational therapist and the director of the Charlotte and Richard O'Connor Parkinson's Family Support Program at Jewish Family and Children's Service. Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease. It's progressive and chronic. It is a movement disorders disease, which means that people who have it have difficulty with their movements, especially something called bradykinesia or slowness of movement. They often will have tremors, but not in all cases. People can have stable periods, and much research is devoted to showing how it can slow progression. Therapies even can provide some improvement for a while, but overall it is progressive. I asked some of our participants what they wanted providers to know, and one of them said that there are plateaus, so it's not a steep decline. It's the second most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease. About one in 100 people over 60 have it. Parkinson's disease has five stages according to a scale called the Hohn and Yar scale. It starts with stage one where only one side of the body is affected. It moves on to stage two where both sides of the body become affected. At these points, most people are pretty independent with their activities of daily living and their mobility. By stage three, we start to see some functional decline with more falling and more challenging ability to complete their activities of daily living known as ADLs. By stage four, they're having a lot more difficulty with their mobility. It's usually requiring a walker and in some cases a wheelchair. And by stage five, usually they're considered to be bed bound or chair bound. Parkinsonism is a term for symptoms of Parkinson's related to the movement disorders, bradykinesia, the slowness of movement. And in many cases, because they don't know what causes Parkinson's, they say that most cases are what they consider idiopathic. So Parkinsonism is a classification of many different diseases that look the same when they first have symptoms. And then as the disease progresses, they may find that it's a different form or caused by a different mechanism in the brain. Some of the non-motor symptoms include apathy, fatigue, depression and anxiety, and they can be a symptom of the disease itself or a secondary effect of having a chronic disease. There are symptoms of Parkinson's that are considered non-motor, such as drooling or a masked face, a difficulty with speech, a soft voice called hypophonia, and that can cause social isolation, which in turn, without that interaction and practice of speaking loudly, can cause more hypophonia and masked face. So it's a very interconnected web such that movement disorder specialists are key in the treatment. The cognitive aspects of Parkinson's can occur in up to 50% by some estimates. They tend to happen later on in the disease, but it's different for everyone. Just because someone has Parkinson's disease doesn't mean that they will develop dementia for sure, but it is shown that as the disease progresses, they're more likely to have dementia and cognitive issues. The slowness of movement is also seen in thinking and in understanding speech. So there's definitely a slowdown in the brain with cognitive difficulties, difficulty with executive function or planning and organizing, and as well as just retrieval and memory. They say Parkinson's is a family disease because it affects everyone in the family, whether it's a care partner, a child, a young child, or adult child. They need to work together and understand the effect it has on their relationships. In a relationship that has the added burden of Parkinson's, many other emotions may come out. I've heard care partners say that they imagined a retirement full of travel and playing with grandchildren, but now they're stuck at home helping to care for their care partner. So it can be devastating to a relationship, to their hopes and dreams for their future and how they anticipated the rest of their lives together would be. One of the difficulties with Parkinson's is something we call freezing of gait, which happens especially in crowded or narrow places. Someone with Parkinson's who's looking to get around, especially in later stages, needs to look for open and accessible areas, just like anyone with a disability. For example, in a movie theater, it's best to try to get there early since movement is slower and to sit in an aisle seat where they won't have to sidestep into the middle because the sidestep and the spacing of the chairs can be challenging for someone with Parkinson's.
Going out in public when there are peak traffic times of people and cars would be challenging. They can produce anxiety, which then produces more of the motor symptoms, which then produces more anxiety, and it's sort of a vicious cycle. So finding those times when it's quiet, as well as the best time of the day for the person with Parkinson's disease according to their medication schedule, a time when they're considered on and moving most freely. There are many inventive devices out there for people who experience the freezing of gait or sort of stuttering with their steps. For example, there's something called a U-step walker, which is more supportive and has an optional laser beam as well as a cane with a laser beam that gives someone with Parkinson's a visual cue to step over when they do get frozen. They can look at the line, step over it, and then get started again. Unfortunately, the medication treatments have not advanced as far as they would like. The L-DOPA treatment that was developed in the 70s is still the gold standard for people with Parkinson's disease. Certainly, there have been advances in how it's administered, for example, an inhaled version for the off periods. However, the slowing of the progression of the disease has been most demonstrated through exercise and wellness. The number one thing someone with Parkinson's can do for themselves is to stay active, to find exercise groups or social networks, something to keep them strong, flexible, moving, with supports of family and friends. Throughout my career, I've had interactions with people with Parkinson's dating back to the early 2000s, leading an exercise group for people with Parkinson's, and I could see that it was beneficial even back then. I've seen how exercise in groups and socialization really takes that mask face and brings a smile to it, and that's so important. I personally have a family member with Parkinson's that's been diagnosed since I started the work in this field, and it's important to me to see that there are programs out there to help people live well with Parkinson's. We have a Parkinson's dance program at Jewish Family and Children's Service that meets weekly. We have a participant who has gone through many different surgeries, fractures, etc. And because of the dance program, she feels connected. She feels that it makes her more loose and limber. And she's come back from surgeries faster than anyone I've seen even without Parkinson's because she knows that people are looking for her and that she wants to be a part of the group again and she feels better when she comes to the group. So she feels that it's, it's a vital part of her therapy and her recovery and her resilience. For a provider working with a person with Parkinson's disease, the important thing is to remember to be patient and to have compassion. Someone with Parkinson's has slowness of movement and things take longer for them. It's frustrating for them even more than it's frustrating for you. So plan ahead, make sure their medications are on when they're moving best and when they're thinking best. And remember that it's not a single disease with one symptom and one cure. It's very complex. It affects every part of their lives. So think about where they're coming from. Put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Thank you for watching this video, and we would love to share more with you. So please subscribe to this YouTube channel. For more information about all of our trainings, please visit the link below.